So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Andy Terenchev. I work with Long as a senior account executive with a focus on building analytics. Uh, and I'd like to thank you all for joining um, and taking the time to learn how building managers can use uh, building automation and analytics as well as ionization and UV lights to improve air quality in order to address occupants' health and safety. That's the key. We will have questions after we go through the presentation. So the agenda is as follows. So Joe and Craig will summarize uh, long in terms of uh, how we're working with our clients uh, during difficult times. Uh, then I'll do a quick high level uh, summary addressing how building managers, owners, facility managers need to incorporate new operational procedures based on industry group and CDC recommendations. And then Bryce Kosnick from Copper Tree Analytics, our fault detection and diagnostics partner, uh, will focus on how building analytics can be used to measure and verify building automation changes in this new operational environment. And then lastly, uh, Jamie Love from Air Reps will summarize additional solutions and products to further increase uh, building safety that include uh, ionization, polarization, UV light to reduce airflow pathogens. Craig, you wanna go ahead and uh, give you a little summary? Please. Good morning, everyone. We just wanna, as long, thank you for your time and uh, thank you for joining this morning. Uh, just a quick uh, summary, if you aren't familiar with Long, Long has been around for about 50 plus years and we're based in seven states, Colorado up through Alaska with our headquarters in Colorado. And uh, we have about 450 employees covering those states. Um, and uh, with this current working environment, we've uh, really been focused on trying to help our customers and our contractors that we support uh, really adhere to uh, the new standards and the new norms. And so we're really excited and proud to be able to offer uh, some of these topics to you from an educational perspective. And uh, please write down your comments, uh, post them in the chat, and we look forward to uh, helping you uh, as you re-enter your buildings for a safe and secure environment. Thanks, Craig. And this is Joe down in Portland. Uh, I manage the Oregon operations down here. And, you know, before, during and after this pandemic, we've always focused on safety in the building, starting with uh, security solutions, which access control and CCTV. Uh, and then, of course, uh, mechanical solutions. And you'll learn more about that from Jamie on air filtration and ionization and those sorts of things to have a healthy air environment. Um, and then, of course, building automation in cooperation with Copper Tree uh, and with the analytics in conjunction with our building automation systems, uh, it's a perfect fit. And so, you know, this whole safety, safe uh, work environment is nothing new to us, but definitely uh, we're in a unique uh, situation now and uh, look forward to the rest of this presentation. And again, as Craig said, post your comments and look forward to addressing everything as we go as we move on. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So what is our desired outcome? Um, improving indoor air quality. You know, after close to four months um, of data from the US and other countries, especially Europe, the virus spreads or the infection rate is much higher indoors, whether you're a restaurant, bar, offices, even, even people's homes, uh, obviously when compared to outdoor uh, infections. Uh, and the key, you know, you look at outdoors, for example, um, data from cities like Seattle and New York show little spread from the recent protests. And it's a combination of outdoor air as well as wearing face masks. In terms of best practices uh, for commercial or government uh, buildings, including school, uh, building automation systems can be programmed to address the existing environment with a focus on a combination of increasing outdoor air changing sequences, set points, and relative humidity levels. Those are high level points that Bryce will discuss further uh, as he comes on uh, after I do. Uh, and then pairing building automation and analytics, uh, specifically fault detection and diagnostics, 
creates powerful insights for greater health and safety. Once you change your B building automation uh, settings, use FDD to measure and verify. That's, that's how the two work together. Um, in terms of energy consumption, uh, when modifying systems in response to improve occupant safety, increasing outdoor obviously will increase energy usage. But nevertheless, um, you know, since buildings will have lower occupancy rates, there will be potential zones that may not be occupied where you can try to save some energy in those zones. But obviously, this focus right now with buildings is so much less on energy and so much more on uh, safety and, and, and health. Um, and then for high level industry recommendations, obviously ASHRAE um, has been around for 100 years and is considered the standard in building management. It's not perfect, uh, no one is, but it continuously updates guidance, including managing buildings in the current environment. Uh, high level recommendations that Bryce and Jamie will cover in more detail include ventilation, uh, increasing that outdoor air, stop recirculating air as much as possible, uh, upgrading filters uh, to MERV 13s, uh, increase relative humidity, and install UV treatment and ionization, which uh, Jamie will cover from Air Reps. And we will email the relevant ASHRAE COVID-19 links or their recommendations to participants in today's call. In terms, um, you know, as I mentioned, occupant, occupancy, occupant safety and health is the key. Uh, we're facing difficult times, uh, difficult choices between opening up the economy after the initial shutdown aimed at not just flattening the curve, but reduce the infection rates to bend that curve downwards. That's, and it, it's been happening for the most part. Uh, nevertheless, safe and health, healthy is paramount and I look at facility managers in a way as our next first responders. Uh, we've learned a lot. We know the virus spreads much more readily indoors versus outdoors. A few stats um, from a May study from University of Massachusetts professor Aaron Bromwich. Um, it takes a, as few as a thousand COVID-19 particles to infect someone. Uh, a single breath releases 50 to 50,000 droplets, and someone who is infected and coughs or sneezes, 200 million viral particles go everywhere. So think about that. That's why masks are effective, where occupants are breathing, uh, especially indoors, uh, and that's common sense. Uh, and if you're an infected person, uh, stay home, isolate. Don't go to the office, don't go to school, let alone bars and restaurants. In terms of um, facility management, which you know, we deal with a lot of facility managers and, um, and love them to that. They're, they're, they are gonna be our first responders. And you know, what do I mean by a new paradigm? A general definition in the business world could mean a new way of reaching out to customers and making money. Think of, the, think of all the stay at home services that have flourished um, during, the, during the stay at home recommendations. Uh, a new paradigm in facilities management could mean a new, new way of making occupants uh, confident and safe. Um, so for example, we already talked a little bit about the energy trade-offs, uh, minimizing outdoor air, economizing was the norm. Uh, I remember actually working with Bryce at Copper Tree when we were finding dampers that were supposed to be open and they were shut uh, when manually, where people put two by fours to sh keep those um, those dampers closed, uh, closed to recirculate air. Uh, the new reality, the new way is to dilute, dilute, um, and obviously vastly increasing uh, outdoor air to purge any uh, as many viruses as possible. And um, and you know it's it's all about making uh, folks feel safer. Uh, some thoughts before I hand it over to Bryce and Jamie. Uh, facility managers that successfully create health and safety uh, will be in demand. 
that goes back to my statement that facility managers are the next first responders. For example, there will be, uh, will there be a health and safety score for buildings similar to what you see uh, in restaurants for food safety, where you see them posted on the restaurant door? And how does that affect building economics? Uh, building with higher safety ratings will attract more occupants from retail, office to schools. Uh, and the higher the, the health and safety rating may mean improved economics, actually, for the building owner, uh, for the building managers. Uh, use data, uh, building uh, automation and al analytics to create your own score before a score may be manda mandated by local, state, and federal government regulations. Um, so Bryce, I'm going to make you the presenter. Thank you, Andy. Yep. I appreciate that. So. Let's get, should be able to control, perfect. All right, well, thank you everybody again for taking the time to sit down with us. Um, what we wanna do is, uh, again, I'm gonna walk through some high level uh, information and then talk about how uh, analytics can uh, help you monitor and verify that your buildings are in fact staying uh, safe and properly ventilated. Um, you know, what, some of the things we wanna, from a high level, we wanna think about is just the amount of CFM and the amount of humidity in the space. So. Uh, how things are changing on that from that in that regard. The part of this is occupant driven, obviously, a large majority of it is occupant driven uh, based on a lot of the studies being done. Uh, what are, you know, as we thought, look to go back to school and we like to go look to, uh, sorry, I look to go back to work. Um, you know, a lot of people are expecting like a staggered shift or a hybrid model where you're working from home uh, two days a week and in the office two days a week within a shift day. Uh, and, you know, my, my kids' schools uh, just announced that they're going to be going to a, uh, a hybrid model. So I've got kids who are going to be home uh, three days a week instead and only in schools two days a week. So I'm going to have to juggle that as a professional as well. I'm not going to be able to go to the office every single day. Um, you know, we're looking for a 4x reduction in density. So meeting rooms for eight are now for two. And then obviously high ventilation rates. And to know that in common areas where there's a lot of foot traffic that uh, the air is being purged uh, pretty routinely, uh, significantly faster than what is currently being uh, recommended by ASHRAE. So when we think about the, so if we look at the different positioning on this, you know, ASHRAE's positioning and recommendation is that we want to maintain and keep uh, relative humidity at between 40 and 60%. Uh, but the, and we want to <clears throat> minimize, we want to recirculate air as much as possible. Obviously, this is something that you have to do under the guidance of, you know, your trusted partners and professional engineering uh, consultants. But look at your individual conditions. Uh, if you have a lot of isolated offices, you know, that's a, that's a place where you may not need to recirculate as much. But those open areas, those, uh, those common areas, they are the recommendation is definitely to increase airflow as much as possible and to increase that uh, outdoor intake as much as possible to help refresh or uh, replace the air uh, as much as uh, can be done uh, appropriately. Now, it's important that we think about, when we think about that from a mechanical system perspective, when you have a standard H uh, rooftop unit or air handler, and it is designed to operate uh, the majority of the time at a you know 15% or 15% economizer, and now we're asking it to go to a 40, 50, 60% economizer or 100% economizer. There's a fair amount of wear and tear that's gonna happen to that uh, piece of equipment. The cooling coils and the heating coils are gonna have to work a lot harder to deal with those uh, conditions. And uh, you can be bringing in very humid air or very dry air. Uh, and you, how are we gonna condition that? So Jamie's gonna talk about that a little bit later on, but it's a very important thing to not forget about. Uh, it's not just about bringing in fresh air. We have to think about how we condition that fresh air. So if we look at the air change rates from ASHRAE, these are generalized numbers um, based on 62.1 addendum N. And if you look at a general area, we're typically at an air change rate of four. Uh, you know, we want to see that lifted as much as possible. And, you know, depending on your use case, uh, you know, you have, uh, taking advantage of ASHRAE 62.1 addendum N uh, can help you help guide you in the right direction as to what's appropriate for your particular situation. Um, 
but in general where we would normally have fairly low air change rates which would be fully change the air you know like once an hour four times an hour uh, we want to drive that down more into the uh, we want to look at how fast we're actually removing particulates. So if we look at the CDC guidelines, which ASHRAE is suggesting that you follow, especially for healthcare facilities, uh, if you want to replace the air in a in two and a half hours, or essentially in two, uh, a little over two hours, then you would need an air change rate of two with 99% efficiency. If you have a common area, like you're a school or a university and you have a passing, uh, a, uh, a period where students are passing beyond each other, or they're walking between hallways, maybe you want to drive that down lower. You want to say, you know what, we want to fully, we want to uh, flush the air out with 99% efficiency during that passing period. Well, then you would want to leverage your control system to go to a 50 air change per minute, or 50 air changes per hour, which would take eight minutes to fully flush the space with 99% efficiency. Obviously, our mechanical systems may not be capable of doing this. So you have to, again, we're going to consult our um, you know, companies like Long and um, air reps and your consulting engineers to figure out what's appropriate for you and what your system can handle. But uh, just to give you an idea, those two very extreme, two extreme differences. If you want to flush your space with 99% efficiency over the course of two hours, you need two air changes. If you want to flush the space with 99% efficiency in eight minutes, then it's um, going to take you 50 air changes. So. Again, uh, you know, it's likely that your HVAC sequence, so practically what this means is you you know, you have to again figure out what's appropriate for you. But, but the, you know, on an average, if you're looking to swap the air with 99% efficiency or 99.9% efficiency, uh, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes is probably a good number to shoot for. Uh, it's, it's a, you know, reasonable, reasonable value that most uh, HVAC systems are gonna be able to meet in certain areas. Obviously, it's going to put more stress on the system, but again, there are uh, there are solutions and opportunities for us to be creative with control sequencing as well as the addition of additional filtering or uh, hardware that can go in, uh, as Jamie will talk about. And then uh, again, you know, trust your you, know, your you have trusted partners for a reason, and you want to take advantage of those uh, partners and really leverage their knowledge and expertise in these areas when making these decisions for your facility and what it means to go back to go back to work. Uh, from a very generic or from a general level, we wanna start with airflow balancing. So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is really confirm that your supply, exhaust and outdoor air uh, intakes are properly calibrated and that you can trust the sensors you have on those. If you don't have airflow sensors, that's okay. Make sure that uh, you, can still, you can still balance them and make sure that if you are at a 100% um, outdoor air, or a, I'm sorry, 0%, 100%, and in between, that you are pulling the appropriate amount of outdoor air uh, as you should. Sometimes you'll see situations where the supply fan is overpowering the uh, the return fan or the exhaust fan, and you're pulling in more return air than you would uh, expect based on just the path of least resistance. So. Uh, you know, catching things like that uh, are important so that you can tr understand, you can you can trust the data coming out of your control system and or your fault detection diagnostics platform to confirm that you are supplying the appropriate amount of fresh air to your building and taking advantage of those uh, those air changes. Uh, you know, knowing your outdoor air and temperature, or your outdoor air temperature and outdoor air humidity are critical as well because we are going to have to have special uh, programming and control sequencing around how to deal with the outdoor air when it is below 40% and above 60% humidity, um, those are gonna be conditions that we have to be very, you know, those are, everybody's unique uh, to a certain extent on that. And, you know, understanding how that's gonna affect your hardware is gonna be critical. Knowing that your dampers are working properly, your valve positions are working properly, your fans are commanding the way that you expect, and you have good airflow is gonna help, will help you uh, go back to work. So there's a couple different strategies we can talk about. Uh, one is you, you're in a situation where you either can't change because you don't have control over your HVAC system or you don't really have a forced air system. Uh, those areas, obviously, again, you know, depending on your situation, you may want to isolate those areas or if, you're, if you have to go into an operation as normal, uh, you know, personal protective equipment or uh, some face masks, 
and then uh, or scheduling, doing shift changes to limit the density in those areas where there are there is no opportunity to change air change rates and uh, improve uh, the air quality is is one strategy or uh, one option there. The reducing occupancy and or going to swing shifts, uh, you know, understanding who's in your building and when and making sure people commit to those times uh, so that you know that you're building this design for, you know, max occupancy of 10,000 is only has two or 3,000 people in it at a time um, or whatever is appropriate for your, if your case. And then obviously we're trying to bring in more outdoor air, uh, increase those air change rates as we've been talking about. We do that by increasing the economizer and by increasing the airflow at the individual terminal units. Uh, leveraging schedules is also important. If you have the ability to uh, schedule swing areas or shift areas, then you can, uh, obviously there's there's an energy component to this and a cost component. Uh, going from zero, you know 10% economizer to 100% economizer is a gonna gonna have a cost impact uh, if there's opportunity for you to maintain existing airflow rates in areas that are cordoned off or that people are not going to be in then take advantage of that don't just turn your whole you don't have to turn your whole building on at once and uh turn you know increase the airflow to 100 percent across the board everywhere uh really take advantage of scheduling uh schedule resolution and then take advantage of proper building purges optimal starts and stops and then leveraging things like guideline 36 has uh, fantastic programming uh, recommendations around trim and response uh, implementing those types of advanced control sequences uh, is going to help you be effective uh, when going back and occupying buildings so again some things that we want to track on a minimum is you want to track your minimum uh, your total supply cfm your total exhaust cfm is going to help you calculate building pressure uh, you're going to want to know your air change rates and your active purge time. You're going to need to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, understand, you're going to want to be able to understand when your filters need to be replaced. Uh, obviously, if we're bringing in more outdoor air than normal, then it's going to affect how frequently your uh, filters need to be replaced. Uh, we want to trend the air change rates. We want to trend purge time. We want to be able to produce clean air metrics. And then we want to have uh, essentially a schedule of operations for uh, the individual pieces of equipment and then understand when things are running and when they are not, especially if uh, if equipment should be running at a time when it, uh, if it should be running when people are in the building and it is not, that, in that uh, increases our probability of um, infection. So moving along. Uh, standard air handler again this is to be a fully flushed out air handler uh, this is also out of guideline 36 and what uh, we're going to want to do on the calibration side so you understand uh, is to calibrate the dampers that economizer damper here uh, so I'm going to use my mouse and understand those airflow rates that your outdoor air your supply sorry your supply air your return air your outdoor air those are you know critically to get you want to get those uh, properly calibrated and measured and then using the return air temperature, the outdoor air temperature, and the supply air temperature, uh, and a mixed air temperature, if you have it, uh, we can take those four data points and we can do a, uh, some, uh, a, uh, a uh, mass volume calculation to determine how much outdoor air is in the supplier stream and use that to validate on the fly the effectiveness of your economizer and what your actual air change rate is in your building. Um, that could be programmed into the BAS or Applications like uh, Copper Trees Fault Detection and Diagnostics Platform can do that automatically for you. Understanding your if your uh, if your air handler does have uh, a VFD, you know, capturing the speed, start, stop, speed, status, um, and any kind of feedback, any data you can get out of that is critical. Uh, that all goes into calculating those proper air change rate calculations. So Copper Tree itself has put together a healthcare compliance package. It's a set of uh, predefined rules and analysis. Uh, this is a small snapshot of it, but the things we're looking at again out of the uh, out of the box reporting is uh, purge mode reporting, uh, air fractional reporting, or outdoor air fractional reporting, understanding how much outdoor air is going into your building, uh, CO2 analysis, pressure or building pressure analysis, and then a lot of scheduling. And then from a comfort perspective, it's important, obviously, our employees are our, uh, our number one asset, and we want to make sure that they are productive uh, in our the space we provide them to work within. Um, and we want to make sure, so we want to make sure that the system is properly controlling. So there's a series of reports around 
uh, room uh, comfort and individual terminal unit functionality and its uh, performance uh, around comfort. So to give you some examples of that, um, you know, out of the box reporting for CO2 analysis and trigger uh, alarm triggering uh, comes out of this package for uh, things like CO2. Uh, this is a purge mode calculation or purge mode plotting. So you can see on a daily basis and we can alert again uh, if uh, anything is not purging for a minimum cycle, but you can understand how long your building is purging for, how long it is, um, uh, how early before the scheduled start time it is turning on to undergo that proper purge cycle. Uh, do a building pressure analysis so we can do the calculations on the fly with either virtual metering or with actual uh, building pressure sensors to determine if your building is uh, positively pressurized. So we want the air in the building to push out of the building. We don't want to suck unfiltered air uh, from outside of the building into the building. So if the, this building, this particular building that we're looking at here uh, had negative pressure, it would be shown in red. But right now it's either neutral or green. Uh, this is a fractional air report where we're looking at the economizer and the outdoor air supply, how much of that outdoor air supply is, is pure outdoor air. Um, there are times when it's 100% outdoor air. There's times when it's almost zero out, outdoor air. And there are uh, periods of time where it's most, uh, for, for the more, uh, majority of this particular unit is operating uh, with an increased economizer position. And it is bringing in majority outdoor air um, in this situation. This is on a daily, this hourly report. For a single day. This is an aggregated report uh, across an entire the month of uh, June for this particular piece of equipment. And you can see on average, you are pulling in more outdoor air than you are recirculating air, which again, will have a cost impact um, and you'll have an impact on your mechanical equipment. But you can, these are reports that you can take to your ownership and to your occupants and make sure that they feel comfortable and understand that the building is uh, being properly ventilated and the air is uh, being purged uh, in a way that they should feel safe. Uh, comfort reporting again. So we have the ability to go in and automatically uh, produce reporting around individual terminal units, VAVs, fan coils, uh, the whole slew of equipment. Uh, but determine, you know, this particular piece of equipment is operating, you know, excellent 65% uh, of the time and you know it's unacceptable five percent of the time so it gets a, a kpi or a score that allows you to determine the excuse me that uh, lets you determine the efficiency of that piece of equipment and make sure that your occupants are comfortable so with that i'm going to turn it over to jamie and let him uh let him take it from here and i'll be around for questions after this that's great thank you bryce Hey everybody, how are we doing today? I want to thank Bryce for uh, from Cropper Tree and obviously Craig, Andy, and Joe from Long. My name is Jamie Love. I'm from Air Reps. Um, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you might be from. So uh, since this pandemic has started, we have been bombarded by indoor air quality um, solutions, people looking for them. Uh, how, how do we approach it? What do we do? And the good news is that people are looking for um, action items, things that they can do that they feel better about their building, um, for their employees, for their customers. We've actually even helped several companies design window clings. Uh, as you enter a building, it'll they'll put something up after they've enhanced their their system that says, you know, basically we have done something. We have we have proactively um, enhanced our HVAC equipment uh, for the safety of of our clients and and our staff, and that's that's gone over really well. I know I I personally feel better about it when I see something like that when I enter a building. Um, so some of the things that we carry or represent, um, there's four things that we kind of uh, take this approach to. They can be used individually um, or they can be used together. The first item that we had a lot of um, activity on is ionization. Um, so Global Plasma Solutions is a needlepoint bipolar ionization product. And how that works is it, it, you know, ions are naturally occurring. They artificially uh, create the ions. It's a positive and negative charge. 
And what it does is it, it agglomerates particles, so it helps remove particles. In that process, it also uh, affects VOCs and gases, as well as odors. It makes the pathogens and any particle larger, kind of snowballs. And what it does is it allows the, the particles to be influenced by the air and pulled back into the return and captured at the filter. So the one nice thing about this technology is that it's active. It treats the space. Um, traditionally, what you see in an HVAC system is um, what we call passive technologies, where you have UV light or filtration um, waiting for the, the pathogen or the particles to get to the technology before they can do anything. Um, GPS actually travels through the ductwork and um, can treat the space. And a little side story, um, my wife is 34 weeks pregnant, so very pregnant, and her nose is working very well. And we actually put this uh, a GPS unit in our own home on our furnace. Uh, we were getting uh, smells from our, just from when we cooked. And our, our boys have uh, pretty allergic to, you know, grass and dust. So we put one on our furnace and I mean, instantly we started noticing um, a huge reduction in odors and the boys sneeze way less often. So it's been a personal success story and most people in our office have actually uh, gone through and installed. And we're starting to see, see numerous uh, commercial applications for this product. Uh, recently installed at T-Mobile Park um, at the Mariners clubhouses in the visitor and home clubhouses and uh, various universities as well. So cool product, something to look out for. It can also be monitored uh, through a BAS and it would pair nicely with um, copper tree analytics and definitely want to consult long and or air reps uh, for more information on that. Uh, moving on, dynamic air quality solutions. So that's going to be more in line with filtration. So uh, the nice thing about dynamic is we've all been told we got to up our um, filtration efficiencies to MRF 13. MRF 13 is 50%, is a 50% filter that captures 0.3 to 1.0 microns, so sub microns, very small stuff, but it allows 50% to go through. And, and one of the things that's not being taken into consideration here is not every system is, can just bump up their static pressure. So as we all know, filters are basically have uh, paper with holes. The smaller the holes, the more efficient the filter, the more efficient the filter, the higher the static pressure, uh, the more static pressure uh, you're dealing with um, higher energy consumption. So what dynamic does is it's a charged polarized media. And what it does is it allows particulate to stick to the filter and it also 360 degree loads. So instead of face loading, uh, which is pretty common, they have load curves that show that they can get eight to, time, uh, eight to 10 times um, more life out of the filter. So that's gonna save you time on uh, you know, filter change outs and it's gonna actually reduce your static pressure because you can eliminate uh, pre and post filters in a lot of situations. So you're actually gonna get a lower static pressure drop and you're gonna get a higher efficiency. They're, they have shown rates of up to MER 15 efficiency and really low static pressure drop. So that's a really unique and uh, nice product that we've seen a lot. And again, it can be paired with GPS. This can be on the, the front, of a, front end of a system and GPS can be uh, typically is found after pre-filters and it treats the air going through the duct into the space. Um, ASHRAE recommendations also uh, for UV. UV has been traditionally used, uh, we see a lot in hospitals. It's typically used on the cooling coil. Um, and what that does is it, it treats biofilm on the coil, which protects your heat transfer, right? So it's an energy saver because it's keeping your coil clean. Um, it can disinfect the air, certainly. Uh, you'd have to get to, you know, two times or more um, before it starts to burn the cell wall of the microbes. So you'd have to juice it up. Uh, the component to that that can be tricky with UV is, is the bulb replacement. You, you really have to do it annually and um, that can get expensive, but it is a great option. And again, can be paired with dynamic, can be paired with GPS and can, again, dynamic um, 
UV lights, GPS, they can all be monitored through a BAS uh, and then analyzed through copper trees. So another cool solution. And then lastly, you know, we Bryce had mentioned several times that RH levels, you know, humidity levels in buildings, it's a big deal. Uh, 40 to 60 percent um, is the optimum level uh, for both pathogen mitigation and just human beings in general. Um, when you find rates under 40 percent that means it's dry air so you're bringing in all this outside air you know it could be dry and you have to condition it uh, that's why people get sick in the winter not because it's cold out it's because the air is dry when the air is dry pathogens have an easier uh pathway to, to travel they stay suspended in air longer and they can get breathed in um, and that affects our health also when the rh is between 40 and 60 um we we operate better. Human beings operate better. Our cilia stays wetter, basically, and it allows uh, if you ingest a pathogen in the air, you can literally cough it out or you can be swallowed and it's de deemed inactive or unharmful. It's when it gets into your breathing pathway, the breathing zone that can really be effect uh, affect you. So Condera makes a lot of different systems. They have in-room systems, in-room systems, uh, direct room systems. I know Museum of Flight in Seattle just put in a big or is putting in a big direct room system for their facility. Um, but humidity should be absolutely considered. And again, all these products, all these ways to treat your building's air quality can be, you know, standalone. They can work together and they can all be tied into a BAS and they can all be analyzed. So uh, again, I just want to thank everybody for their time and I'll pass it back to Andy. Hello guys. Thank you, Jamie. That was great. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is, um, I want to make sure I can um, everyone on the, the participants, uh, maybe if there are any questions that you guys have, maybe you guys could either chat or uh, even just ask them through um, through your speaker. Jonathan has a question here over on the right, it looks like. I, I can read it to everybody. That would be great. <laughs> I can read Jonathan's question. I don't know if Jonathan's still on. Uh, so Jonathan's question is about practical measures that are applicable for facility operators and owners. It seems to be an oversimplification in terms of guidelines that demand less economization and more outside air. While in theory that might be acceptable for temperate climates, i.e. Portland and so on, uh, he's, probably look, he's probably thinking about Central Oregon. Uh, but unattainable for more extreme climates found in the states where we serve, uh, uh, where we serve unless it's been. So in other words, it's 28 degrees outside or 15 degrees outside, and we're bringing in 100% outside air, I think is his concern. So maybe Jamie and or Bryce or anybody else with expertise. Bryce, yeah. Bryce you want to take that? Sure. So, yeah, I, I understand um, the concern. I, I mean, I, I remember working on the uh, Southern Oregon. I remember working on the Medford uh, High School renovation in the middle of winter, and it was uh, cold. So, yeah, I, I mean, that's the, a lot of the the challenge here is how do we manage it's when the mechanical systems aren't designed for 100% outdoor air intake, uh, we can't expect them to just work in a, in a DOAS situation, in a, a DOAS configuration. Um, so the, you know, practically what, what it means is we have to either take advantage of technologies inside the building to filter and clean the air and maintain the lower air change rates, or we have to schedule uh, the building in a different way where the total occupancy and the total the amount of people are, uh, the density of the building is reduced to a uh, to a level where the uh, air change rate that the building is currently designed for is acceptable. So, and what I mean by that is, if you look at how a building is typically designed, you have a design occupancy uh, for the number of people. Now, typically in the in the heating situation in particular, 
that the heating load tends to fall below the breathing requirement or the fresh air requirements of the population or the de the population density of the, the the location or area of the building, and that's what determines that uh, that minimum value is the, the population density for that space. The on the cooling side, the cooling load is vastly out out numbers that number, so it's not a big deal in the cooling uh, in a cooling condition. Uh, but the heating coils are sized for the typically for the small or the lower condition. Um, Jamie can talk more to you know equipment efficiencies and upgrades or you know filters of that nature. But um, it, it really is it's important. Like practically, I would say what it means is we have you have to look at your building and its use case and what is its actual uh, expected occupancy on a day-to-day -day basis. And then using that re hopefully reduced occupancy number, you can determine if there's an if there's a need to uh, increase or uh, re keep the systems operating at uh, the same levels that they are that they were designed for currently, just at a greatly reduced occupancy rate, especially in the middle of winter or in the middle of summer uh, when you are at design load calculations. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that as well, um, you know, ASHRAE 62.1, they, they talk about um, the outdoor air requirements when you have an air cleaning device, um, which could be GPS, it could be dynamic uh, in UV as well. Uh, anything that they consider to be a, a, a cleaner of air, it, it allows you to, to actually reduce your outside air that your requirements. So we're kind of in this weird time right now where we're being recommended to bring in outside air, and we all know that, that that has a lot of trickle down effect of how that affects our building, how that affects our static, how that affects our filtration, uh, air air changeover. Um, it's not as simple as just bringing it in, just like you mentioned. Uh, so before the pandemic hit, you know, one of the things that GPS and both dynamic were were leaning heavily on was that both products were seen as a energy saver uh, ways that you could uh, per ash rate uh, you could limit your outside air uh, you can reduce your outside air because you are cleaning it um, so both both products um, boast that and since the pandemic hit you know nobody really wants to talk about reducing outside air but it's certainly an option um, as the as the gps with the agglomeration can make Filter efficiencies, uh, they've done third party testing where a Mervate filter, um, which is pretty common in the building, um, it, it outperforms a Merv, Merv 12, Merv 13 filter with the technology. And they have third party testing showing a Merv 12 filter with the technology performs like a Merv 15. Uh, dynamic, same same kind of setup. They, they are able to produce um, Merv 15 efficiencies and actually have a, a lower pressure drop because they're able to uh, limit outside air as well uh, because it's considered a cleaning device. So those might be options for you to take a look at where you don't have to bring in as much, maybe not as low as uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, they can go through, but there are IAQP uh, uh, charts and tables that can be used to determine that. And like Bryce was saying, based on occupancy and and seeing that we're going to have a reduced occupancy in buildings, at least for the short term, like he was mentioning, you know, swing shift or alternating shifts or days on, days off, it's probably going to be helpful as well. That's great, Jamie. Uh, another question for you. Does the addition of the GPS bipolar ionization have any impact uh, to the operation of the existing system, life cycle, maintenance, operation noise? Oh, uh, no. So the nice thing about GPS is it's, you know, ions, their life cycles, you know, about 60 seconds. They're constantly being produced. Um, they move with the air. So where the air goes, the ions go. Um, if the air is not going, the ions don't go anywhere. Uh, doesn't make any noise. It's a long life cycle. There's virtually no maintenance there because um, there's really not much there. It's carbon fiber and for example, I'm, I'm not an electrician by any means. I, I put one in my house. We have a, a, a drive specialist in our office, and he kind of walked me through a couple of tools, went down to Home Depot, and I grabbed a couple of items and um, connected to my L1, L2, and my ground. 
and it actually comes with, uh, like I said, BAS contacts, dry contacts. If you, if you need to, I obviously didn't need it for my house, but um, so yeah, it doesn't make any noise and, and you see results right away. Uh, makes your filters more efficient, reduces odor. Uh, it can affect, they have a list of like 520 uh, gases that it can affect and help break down uh, for VOCs, you know, off of plastics or whatever, you, you know, in harsh yeah, environments. So it's a pretty cool product. Um, I was able to install it myself. We, we had a lot of contractors doing, um, you know, from large facilities like universities. And we have a lot of like dental clinics and vision clinics, um, you know, smaller business type stuff, kind of strip mall application with rooftop units. They're being installed there and, and the, the contractors love them because it's a really quick, easy install. Uh, the business owners like them because it's they get to check the box that they've done something they notice a result right away and the maintenance from a facilities uh, standpoint is is basically zero there's really not but you kind of set it and forget it so it's a cool option uh, back to dynamic too you know if you're going to have filtration there with the polarized media they actually have dynamic is used in the actually ashray headquarters and it was seven years before they needed to uh, change out their filters and it's same same way you can monitor your filters through static pressure drops and it took them seven years to get to the point where they needed to change them out so another really cool solution too is is the dynamic product that's great another question and i think it's probably a bryce question and it's quite interesting is anyone considering the introduction of plants to their um sorry I just missed it let's get another question okay so is anyone considering the introduction of plants um to their buildings as supplemental air cleaning devices if so what sources sources are you working with especially to determine which plants manage relative humidity and uh and the uh, efficacy of certain plants. So I don't know if that's anyone will have an answer for that question, uh, Chance, but it's a good question. I, th I think the cannabis is probably the best plant for that. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm sorry. I might be wrong on that. I'll have to, check, I'll have to fact check that. I love that. <laughs> yeah, I, so, to be honest, I have not heard of uh, bringing in additional uh, uh, plant life to a building to act as uh, uh, additional filtration system or fil uh, I don't know I honestly don't know about the effectiveness of it acting as a filtration system obviously it will help with co2 and um, you know the, the amount of oxygen in the space but um, yeah I, I don't know Jamie do you have I really don't have a, an answer for that all right, I don't no, know. that's it's actually a, a really cool uh, thought process. I I would be interested to hear about that as well. I because we know it, we know they do certainly play a part. Um, I don't know if there's studies in a, in an office uh, space that would show that, but maybe there is. Um, I love the idea. Um, I see another question on here from Marty. Looks like yeah. they're asking about GPS and dynamic. I don't see that they filter a smaller particulate. So COVID-19, wouldn't we see still want to dilute the virus particulate counts with more air exchanges to reduce its particulate count? Yes. So let me let me tackle this one. So yes and no. So GPS and dynamic, they both they built both will agglomerate particulate. So what, what happens is when you're charging, you have a plasma field when it's been charged, you're you have these ions that are grabbing on to particulate. When they grab onto the particulate, they are affecting uh, either the pathogen or they're in they're agglomerating it by making it bigger. Things start sticking to it. It starts snowballing and getting larger. That's how they 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 uh, justify their MERV efficiencies. They've had particle reduction, third party testing in, in labs. Um, both products have where you've gone into like a clean room environment. Uh, there's hospital data where they've gone in uh, to the surgical clean room, taken, taken particle counts, and then with both technologies gone in, then done particle counts later, and they've seen vast improvement to particle counts. So yes, you still want to bring in outside air for dilution, right? So the thought process behind that is you're bringing more, more air, and therefore you're diluting the space. 
but while having both items or both products, one or the other, they're agglomerating any particles that are in the space that makes particles like the COVID virus um, attached to other particles and making them bigger, making them easier to filter, if that makes sense. Um, the virus is 0.125 or 0.15, depending where you read microns, which is below the MERV rating threshold of 0.3, you know, so it's significantly smaller than what the MERV ratings are even set up to catch. Um, so by agglomerating them, you're making them either heavy enough to fall out of the breathing zone or big enough to be influenced by the air that then pull it back to the return, which can then, uh, you know, be caught up in the filtration as well. So um, definitely want to still bring in outside air, not saying not to, but you may not need to bring as, as many with an air cleaning device. That's great. Thank you, Jamie. All right. Uh, another question, any examples of practical application from long of integrating building automation analytics and people tracking app to optimize operation based on density beyond CO2 tracking? That's a great question. Um, certainly using building automation and analytics uh, in an integrated fashion has been done quite a bit by long with Copper Tree. Uh, other fault detection and diagnostics providers uh, and, you know, primarily relying on CO2 levels in terms of uh, looking at uh, comfort levels and making sure people, you know, the whole thing about CO2 used to be, you know, decrease CO2, people are going to be more productive. Now, there will be tracking of occupants and uh, we have a very strong security business with cameras. Uh, there's going to be some applications based on what um, what the security people are doing in terms of cameras and additional sensors. Uh, that's probably just in beginning stages. Uh, obviously, they are going, I'm sure there are plenty of developers working on apps to be able to track. Yep. Yeah, let me jump in. This is okay, please. Craig Engelbrecht. So, yeah. uh, so we have not had a installation here locally uh, that uh, has the Bluetooth uh, tracking, uh, but yes, that is the capability uh, with the DizTech uh, controls uh, and or the Acuity lighting control. So there's two different options for tracking uh, is using Bluetooth um, in the lights and so if you retrofit your uh, your lighting to led lighting you can now get those uh, led lights with a bluetooth device in them that then tracks the number of individuals with bluetooth devices in the room so you can it's anonymous it doesn't know who and what bluetooth device but then essentially every phone that walks in uh, with bluetooth on uh, knows then occupancy um, the second is to be able to uh, install a small Bluetooth device that also has temp and, um, and humidity as well. And so you can install those uh, sensors throughout your building and be able to pick up occupancy. Uh, we're looking at different options that might be a little more creative in the short term, um, you know, using uh, the security access control data. Uh, when you're swiping your badge uh, to go into a building, uh, we can pick up number of individuals coming in and going out. And uh, we can also uh, look at Bluetooth devices uh, right at the elevator. So people coming on and off elevator cabs and track the number of uh, individuals coming on and off uh, for different floors. So there are some really interesting creative ways with technology moving forward that that is available today to also help with that tracking. And once you have that data, now using the Copper Tree Analytics, merging that data with the other interval uh, time series data coming out of the building automation system, you can start to really get some better decision-making uh, ability. That's great, thanks, Greg. Uh, another question, uh, what rough order 
of magnitude costs are we talking about with retrofitting some of this technology into existing HVAC and control systems? I'll do a little bit on the building analytics and then pass it off to Jamie in terms of uh, GPS, uh, polarization, UV. Uh, in terms of building analytics of fault detection and diagnostics, uh, it's priced on a square foot basis. Uh, so, and, and, you know, the larger the square foot, feet that a analytic solution like copper tree uh, monitors uh, the less that the price on a square foot basis so as volume goes up the price per square foot uh, goes down uh, there is uh, an initial setup fee and but in general it's just pennies uh, in terms of the cost per square foot jamie you want to try to address <laughs> some of um, your products yeah kind of kind of similar answer to be honest with you um depending it depends on building size and what you're running right so you know if you have one package rooftop unit if you're talking about you know a multiple story uh, and you have larger air handlers uh, it just depends on how you're moving the air through your space um gps has a modular uh, product that can be used across coils for large air handlers um We've seen 100 ton plus um, use the product for their modular, um, which is obviously going to be more expensive than, let's say, a small roof rooftop uh, package unit. Um, and we've seen smaller units. So you're looking at costs of the unit itself, and then you're looking at uh, installation and then how many there are, right? But really, really affordable, actually. Um, that's been the feedback we've seen from everybody. Um, regarding GPS. And now as far as dynamic goes, um, you might you're going to have an upfront cost, certainly. But you know, a lot of times you're it's allowing you to remove your pre and post filters. And then when you consider that you're not changing them out nearly as often and you're getting better efficiency and lower lower uh, static pressure drops, it, it pays for itself. It, there there is an ROI element there um, where you're going to you're going to see it uh, break even and then save money at a certain point. And that, that happens fairly quickly when you consider a uh, filter change out. So again, it depends on the size of the system that you're running and the equipment that you're using, but certainly it uh, it's going to make sense. UV, um, I would say the knock on UV, to be honest with you, would be it's the annual change out. Similar upfront cost, maybe slightly less than uh, like a GPS or a dynamic solution. The issue with uh, UV has always been bulb replacement. Um, every year you're replacing bulbs and you're having someone come out or your facility group or staff is, is doing that and um, they get pricey. So even if it's slightly less on your first go around, it, you're, you're going to chew through that um, pretty quickly on an annual basis just to replace bulbs. Condair, uh, humid humidification systems. I mean, there's very large systems, um, direct room systems, there's in-room systems, um, it really depends again on, on your setup, but relatively low cost uh, considering what you get, uh, the results that you get from the product. Um, I wish I had a better answer, but if I knew more about your setup, I could certainly give you some uh, ROM numbers for sure. Thanks, Jamie. Um, yeah, and in terms of going back to building analytics, uh, you know, I know that Jamie mentioned ROIs. The ROIs for building analytics, fault detection and diagnostics run anywhere between three and five times your annual license fee and setup fee in year one. And that's based just on energy savings, right? Um, there are labor efficiencies of using data to become, uh, anal using data and analytics to take a, uh, an approach with maintenance that is not just a scheduled approach uh, for pre preventative maintenance. And now with the whole question of uh, health and safety, uh, as you saw the reporting that Bryce was showing in terms of CO2, uh, the air handlers, the amount of indoor, uh, outdoor air, uh, their relative humidity levels. I think that there is going to be uh, a real need for having uh, building analytics as a layer on top of your building automation system uh, during the next maybe a year or longer until we resolve uh, the issues with the virus. Uh, anyway, any other questions? Oh, I think we're all set. I appreciate the great questions and the great, uh, and your time.
uh, hope this was valuable. Uh, we covered a lot from, uh, you know, generally what's going on in the new paradigm to, you know, great uh, reporting on a part of corporate tree analytics in terms of, um, you know, given what we're working with in trying to make air quality uh, better for building occupants, make them feel more confident, as well as uh, air reps and, you know, using ionization, ultra, ultra uh, violet right, lights, polarization, all those uh, products are in high demand. And that's, there's, there's reasons for it. Um, and I will send out a follow up with the recording uh, of, of this session so you guys can have that as well as the uh, ASHRAE COVID-19 links for their recommendations in terms of how to work with your buildings. Appreciate it and have a good rest of the day. Thanks Thank everyone. You. Thank you everybody. Have a great day.